What's up, everybody? It's Brand Man Sean, and I'm back with another episode of Inside the Network, where we share exclusive content from inside of brandmannetwork.com. Now, this is a very special episode because I'm sharing the full interview I did with George Goodrich, founder of Playlist Push. And the reason I'm sharing the full interview is because they actually have a service that you might be considering whether you want to use or not. And I think it's important to have a full consideration, get an understanding of the background of the founders, how they think and how they approach the company. That way you can allow that to form, you know, how you deal with the company. I think more information when it comes to these type of interviews is better. So I wanted to make sure I put the full interview out there. Also, they get really deep into how they approach the company and quality control, probably around 24 minutes in this video, but, I think it's important to watch the entire thing through. So once again, you have the most information possible to decide whether you want to even move forward with a company like this or not. So let's get into it. Oh, what's up everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean and I have a very special guest for you guys. This is George Goodrich, CEO of Playlist Push. Now, if you don't know Playlist Push, it's a service that off has a network of curated playlist and through these playlists of course they allow artists right to, to use the service if you get approval and pair you with proper playlists and george you'll see just from our background uh, from the talk we have this isn't his first uh, foray into the playlist game um he's, he's come up and he's been in music as uh, for a while so let's without further ado i think it's going to be a very interesting conversation so check it out now george First of all, first and foremost, uh, appreciate you doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. No problem, man. No problem. And like, I want to start here, right? Because the earliest that I know about your uh, your background, just from uh, I believe it was an article that, that that popped up online or something. One mm -hmm. time when I googled your, uh, I, I googled playlist push, which mm -hmm. that reminds me of another article I gotta ask you about. But um, mm -hmm. it was Re Repost Network, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. bef was Repost Network your first time really getting into music at all? Or how did you get there? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, really long story short, I used to actually, so I went to UCLA, but I dropped out. But when I was going there, uh, I worked at a private country club called Bel Air Country Club. So mm -hmm. I met a lot of people that worked in music, a and R's. Uh, agents and I was like damn this is cool like these people seem to have a good life and I think this is what I want to do so <laughs> and I'd always been involved in music I would go to festivals go to shows and I was always kind of trying to figure out like I got to a point where I was always obsessed with like all right who's the promoter like, like who's running this party like instead mm. of just like focusing on the music so I was always kind of like trying to meet people and figure out who's behind the scenes um, and then from then uh, I actually moved to Australia so my idea was, okay, I can move to Australia. I'll try to bring back some Australian bands to the States. Cause that was a time when like Tame Impala, um, uh, band called cut copy, a lot of Australian bands were coming over and breaking in the States. And I was like, okay, cool. It'd be easy for me to go over there and do that. Uh, so I moved over there and then that the theory was to move back and then be able to ask one of those members for a job at, you know, a bigger label or an agency. Um, <laughs> so I did that and then lived in Australia for a year uh worked at a venue booking shows uh tried to manage a few indie bands uh and then eventually uh moved to amsterdam and then when i moved to amsterdam i started getting into more of startups and technology and kind of started getting out of management decided that's not what i wanted to do okay. um and then eventually um i just met just started meeting people i'd go to events um and i met my a co-founder uh, Ludo Helder so he had already built a website called Demo Drop so it was a way for up and coming uh, mostly electronic music producers to send their music to like bigger DJs and bigger producers in hopes of getting their music played by that DJ because at that gotcha. time that was kind of how you broke through if you were a, a bigger yeah. um, electronic artist at least so um, yeah I mean worked on that for a long time and then eventually I moved back to the states um, you know interviewed at like CAA, William Morris, bombed all those interviews, um, <laughs> like just really bad. Um, what did you, I, I got to stop you. What did you learn from bombing those interviews? Um, I think just how, 
sometimes from the outside you think that like music is is fun and like it's exciting and it's cool and it's chill but uh the interview at ca was like very like corporate very structured and very just like super fast kind of like hard hitting just rapid fire questions that i wasn't really ready for you know i thought we were gonna like hang out and then like drink a coffee and like people were gonna be interested to meet you but they didn't give a shit they're like okay like where'd you go to school what'd you do what experience do you have what publications do you read and i'm like uh and just yeah it was it was terrible um yeah so um, but hey, glad that happened. So when I moved back to LA, it actually took me like eight months to actually find a job in music. And I told myself, I was like, I'm not going to do anything else until I find a job in music. I'm not going to get a job at a restaurant, nothing. So mm. bank account was dwindling. Uh, and then I found a uh, repost network and I applied and uh, they hired me as their not first employee, I think second, like second hire. Um, and then, yeah, I started, uh, started out working for them. And our main thing was SoundCloud monetization. So that was when SoundCloud had kind of rolled out SoundCloud Go, the subscription service, and you started seeing ads pop up on SoundCloud. So right. the bigger label artists, they had the direct deal with SoundCloud. So we mm-hmm. had a deal with SoundCloud where we could grab any independent artists and we could basically plug them into our network and they could start getting paid for their streams on SoundCloud um hmm. that was the core Wait, of our so, you, so you guys were the the middleman to allowing artists to get paid did you does that mean you guys acted somewhat as a label but only in that one function kind of but really um i mean a label they kind of like figure out creatively more what's going to happen and for us it's like hey whoever has traffic whoever has like a certain amount of streams and followers will sign them up whether it's like you know chill electronic music or like ugly god got it like that that kind of end of the spectrum um and that was kind of go ahead uh, what would they um what would be the criteria outside of just plays right because okay it's obvious why the direct to label relationship would exist but i'm just trying to figure out from a soundcloud perspective right like what what would the value of being allowing the other third parties that aren't technically a label to bring people in were you guys like a quality control um, aspect of it or what, what does that yeah like from I mean, your perspective yeah for sure i mean we had to definitely see the opportunity there but for us it was more or less they had to have at least like five thousand streams on a song i think so okay. if we go to a profile we'd be able to see like okay this guy has some traction you know he has like three songs out but there's a good possibility he's going to continue to release music and, uh, you know, we take a small percentage from him being able to monetize uh, his channel, basically. Got it. Okay. Um, so that was huge. And this was like three or four years ago. So this is when like um, Ugly God and like the whole SoundCloud thing was like kind of like a thing. That was when like SoundCloud rap was really starting to take off. All right. Uh, so it was, it was an interesting time. And um, yeah, our main thing was just, you know, signing up artists to the platform and then eventually we started taking the artists on SoundCloud and started uh, distributing them to uh, the DSPs like Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from there, we started seeing a few artists we work with like, oh, wow, they're getting like, they're making a ton of money from Spotify. Like what's going on? So they were getting added to these huge Spotify playlists. And that was also back when you could email Spotify and say, hey, we have this artist or whatever, and you can get in touch with the editorial team. So a few artists, you know, went from making basically nothing to making like five to 10 G's a month, uh, mm. at least, and getting record label deals. Um, so that was really, that was kind of the thing that tipped me off on the whole playlist thing. That was like, where I was like, wow, this is kind of like where things are going, right? If Got you can it. get on some good playlists, like you're gonna get noticed. So um, yeah, from there, um, I, wrote an ebook about it called um, how do you Spotify playlist to launch your career in music? Uh, it's not even a book. It's like 25 pages. It's basically <laughs> like a, a long detailed blog post. And that came out, I think the end of January, 2017. So Got it. people started buying the book and then, you know, they would reach out and say, Hey, can you do this for me? Or can you help me out? And so I was kind of scrambling to, you know, help people promote their music. And then I told Ludo, uh, 
my co-founder, I said on demo drop, I said, Hey man, I think there's an opportunity here because the main thing we were hearing from artists was, uh, they, you know, have no direct channel or direct plug to Spotify, or they've used other services that have been pretty much a scam. So paying someone like two grand or four grand and they basically just say, Oh yeah, sorry. The curators didn't like it. So I, I knew, I knew that there was some kind of like middle ground of right. a network we could build. Um, and then, yeah, man, we started just finding people to own playlists, signing them up, um, running our friends music through it. It started as an email system and campaigns were like $40 and we had like eight curators and your mm -hmm. one song just went to all the curators. Uh, there was no like targeting. It wasn't, you know, select genres. Um, wow. And that was kind of how it started. And now, and that was in June, 2017. Um, and we've ran like 9,000 over 9,000 campaigns now. So wow. it's, it's, yeah, it's getting pretty dialed. It's, uh, and it's fun. We have some like bigger, um, major label clients, but you know, we work with artists that are just uploading their first song on Spotify too. So it's, it's been really cool. It's been fun. What would you say you've learned from 9,000 campaigns? Um, I would say just managing expectations. Um, mm. So, like we try to put as much information as we can on our website and our blogs and things I write about because for us, it's like, we see whatever you're doing as just fuel on the fire, right? We're, you're not going to spend $400 with us and, and go viral and give millions of streams. That's not really right. the goal. We're just more in for like the long term um, goal of building an audience out on Spotify, right? In hopes right. Of eventually you investing with us and using playlist push will make sense down the road. Um, so I think that's been the biggest thing is just, yeah, managing expectations. And also I think the thing we do well is like we communicate very closely with all the artists that works with us. So from day one, the campaign starts, as soon as you get added to a playlist, you get an email instantly. So it's not like PR where you pay someone and they're like, Oh yeah, we got you on this blog or uh, oh yeah, we're reaching out to the fader or whatever and just bullshit. We're there every step of the way telling you exactly what's happening from when the campaign starts to when we send you like the final report of basically everything that's happened. So I think the biggest thing is like just keeping people informed that you're working with. That's the biggest key for us. Got it. Interesting. Um, how many artists do you, cause that's email heavy. How many artists do you have the capacity to manage at once? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it, it's it's always been just kind of a, a dance between building out the network of curators and then also making sure we have enough campaigns to serve those curators, but not too mm. many. So what happens is, is certain dates will just block out. So for whatever reason, everyone wants to release their music this Friday eventually that campaign will just be blacked out and you won't be able to send your song out to curators on that day. So mm. that makes it much easier for us to kind of gauge. Uh, we also, we don't do anything to like stuff the gas pedal down. We don't, we spend literally no money on ads. So we spend like a little bit of money on AdWords just so we pop up if you Google us, but mm. Facebook, uh, Instagram, we do zero advertising because we're kind of just growing at a nice pace, but also making sure we can serve all the people that are working with us. Right, you're trying to keep it manageable. Yeah, exactly. Right, that makes me think, do you, do you guys see a, an aspect where it would scale out, right? It's, it's building it manageably, but then some aspect where it's like, yo, let's put some gas on this thing and blow it up to a larger scale where, I don't know, it, it's some full, scale operation whatever full scale means right that's all relative but but you yeah. know what i mean where yeah, maybe yeah. there's investors involved or whatever yeah for sure i mean that's something that we think about a lot and i think i'm glad that we never did anything to like stuff the gas pedal down or you know we, we haven't raised money it's been basically bootstrapped from day one um because typically that's what those if someone invests that's what they, what they want to see they want you to grow at this unreasonable rate yeah. but yeah. what would happen is a bunch of artists wouldn't get results and it would just be a nightmare. So it's been easier for us to just kind of trudge along. And, you know, as we build out Spotify, eventually we want to add in other services and that's going to help us scale. So whether that's Instagram influencers on the platform, um, YouTube playlists, YouTube channels, 
um, TikTok. So we've really got Spotify dialed. Now we're kind of trying to figure out, okay, how can we like differentiate our offering and still serve the artists we work with and, you know, help them hit their goals. Got you. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So that's from a business perspective before we get in, cause I definitely want to ask you some things in terms of like, what are those difficulties of just being a playlister and how artists can look out for scams or even mm-hmm. some tips that they can have. But just from a sheer business perspective, hearing you talk about that bootstrapping versus having an investor and how they want you to scale so quickly. Mm-hmm. What has it been like? Have there, have you had those moments? Cause I know I have in business where it's like, yo, I wanted this thing to grow fast. I'm trying to grow it as, uh, fast, but then certain things have to work out, work themselves out. And you, then maybe a few months later, you're like, you know what? If we grew that fast, it probably would have killed us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think like my theory with art, not only artists, but with business is however fast you take off, that's as fast as you're going to drop off. Mm-hmm. Right. So if an artist comes out of nowhere and they just blast off and you have no idea who they are, but they're massive, they're going to drop usually pretty quick after that. And I think that's the same thing with business. Like if, whereas, and if you're an artist, if you're like in the trenches, you start out DMing people on Instagram, like that's literally how you start your music career to, you know, getting up to like starting to tour and then like really taking you years to build. It's going to take you a lot longer before you tail off. And I think that's the same thing with business. So we've grown at like a nice reasonable rate. And yeah, I mean, I have friends that work at like tech companies like, oh, you need to be doing these ads and you you should be doing uh, influencer marketing and you should be doing all these things. And it's been nice to just that what we have done has worked, right? It's like, it's, we've been growing at a slow pace, but it's, it's, you know, it's worked for, for us and it's, it's a lot easier for us to manage and, you know, slowly add in systems, hire new people if we need to. Um, instead of just like jamming the gas pedal down for the sake of making as much money as we can. Got you. Do you look at any other playlist networks as competition? Doesn't have to even be a particular name, but is that a Mm -hmm. space where it it feels like, hey, I got to beat these guys if they're performing? Or is there even a way to even gauge what other playlists are doing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a point in time... um, it's just happened recently. We've just, I start seeing a lot of ads come up for playlist companies or Spotify promotion, you know, $25, $300, whatever. Usually, you know, crappy websites, you have no idea who's behind it or what's going on. And we were kind of like freaking out like, Oh man, we're seeing all these ads. We need to start running ads. And I'm like, well, really we don't because I think what happens is people will use those services that are being advertised for them um and they don't get that great a result and then they might dig a little bit deeper and say okay like what's a good company that can like actually do this and then hopefully they find us so by all those other companies running ads it's just raising awareness to artists that oh wow this is a thing i didn't know i could do this before so it, i think it's actually in our benefit that uh, yeah. we didn't go down that hole and say oh wow we should run ads because for all we know, those companies have like 10 clients, right? A month, if that. Um, like just because someone's running ads, it doesn't mean they're killing it. Usually it's the opposite. Um, right. So sure. I'm glad that we held off and didn't go down that rabbit hole to, um, to you know, basically just follow all of those new companies. Right. I, it's funny you said that because working at a, at a startup, that's when I really learned um, from really the CEO how you just never know what's going on behind the curtains for any other company. You can't yeah. over focus on the, on the front. That was actually my first version of like people say, you just see the highlights. Yeah. I basically was getting that from a business perspective. Like that's what you see. Okay. It looks like they're killing it. They just dropped this badass article, whatever, but yep. you got to keep moving on your own operation. So that I respect. hundred percent. What are you guys doing to get business, um, by the way? So is this all referrals since y'all aren't so actively putting out um, the name? Yeah, I think a big of it is, or a big part of it is just referrals. It's just word of mouth. Um, People use it, they get results, and then they tell their friends. And I think the good thing about it is if people get results, it's directly related to the music. 
So if you have good music and you get results, those people usually know other people that have good music. So it kind of just like feeds off each other. So when people get results, they tell other people about it. And yeah, I mean, a lot of our business is just people introing me to, Hey, this is my friend who's a manager. Or this is my friend who has like a digital agency. Um, so, I mean, that's really been, I think the biggest thing is, is just word of mouth. Yeah. We, I mean, we have some good articles out there about like Spotify and playlists and things like that. Um, and those are all nice, but I think really the main driver is just people telling each other about it. Got you. That reminds me when I, cause when, when that's what I was thinking about earlier when I said I saw an article, how'd you guys get an article in fortune? You've only been around what, two years now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's not, I mean, it's not the best article in the world. Um, if you read it, I mean, it's, it's cool that we're in there, but uh, like they say, like any press is good press. Right. Um, <laughs> but, and it's, it's funny because I talked to that dude and I was sometimes, sometimes you get so fired up to like mm -hmm. talk to fortune or, or Forbes or Rolling Stone or whoever, <clears throat> you don't think about like the angle they're taking. Right. Mm -hmm. You're just like, Oh wow. This guy's like excited and interested in our business. And yeah. so he writes this thing like, oh, yeah, this is like a murky Spotify playlist thing. And I'm like, damn, dude, this dude roasted us. Like, didn't see. Yeah. He didn't really make, I wouldn't say he made things up, but a few of things, I mean, it, it wasn't the most, he's not the most diligent dude. And I remember just hitting him up like 12 times like, hey, man, can you hot link playlist push, please? Can you link to our website? Um, and he's like, nah, or he wouldn't even email, email me back. So, huh. I mean, and I guess this goes for artists too. And if you have a company, it's like, just cause someone's reaching out and they want to know about your business, doesn't mean they're going to talk about it. Like it's like the, the latest, greatest thing. Right. Right. Right, um, right. And I guess that's why people hire PR companies. But honestly, I think <laughs> that, um, that was actually a really good thing for us. Cause a lot of bigger label executives like saw that and they're like, Oh, like, what, what are these guys doing? Like, what is this? Like they they were genuinely interested. They didn't care if it was like negative or, you know, wasn't talking about um, playlist push. Like it was awesome. They were just interested that we were in there. Right. And that they yeah. saw us. So right. um, yeah, that was an interesting, interesting point in time <laughs> in, in the timeline. Yeah. I think I didn't expect that particular takeaway, but I think that's a very strong takeaway for artists and well, again, people in general, that whole, if people are reaching out, you don't know why you can't expect these great angles because we've seen again and again where artists have interviews and then they get asked with certain questions and they're not ready for them and they look crazy. Yeah. So <laughs> exactly. that's, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Um, well, now I, I got to ask your perspective man, on all these changes that are coming along with Spotify, right? Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're constantly changing, right? But like some of the things like their user curated playlists and trying to, it seems that they're trying to push more for their own playlist, which they're in control than for these sure. third party user generated playlists and, and things of that mm -hmm. nature. How do, how do you even feel about that as a whole? Yeah. I mean, for us as a business, it's obviously it's super tough because Spotify, they want to have in a perfect world, they have complete control of everything and there's no user generated playlists. There's just their playlists that they have and that's how everyone consumes music. Mm. The good thing for us is I think people want to dig a little bit deeper. Like if you're like me, I want to find like specific playlists. Like last weekend I was in Joshua Tree. So like I wanted to listen to like some classic rock. So I looked at like Joshua Tree playlists and that's like mm. a very specific kind of like moment mood place where mm. yeah, Spotify has thousands of playlists but I actually think it's more interesting if I'm listening to a playlist that's made by someone who's just like a normal Spotify user like me, than like the corporate interest of like the rap caviar playlist, right? right. Or the whatever the, um, yeah, I mean, the, the politics of, of that playlist and how those labels fit in there, right? So <laughs> I think it's tough for us, but I think we're trying to get more people to create playlists. So instead of saying like, all right, how big is this, like how many of these playlists are on Spotify we can even work with? Like, what's the ceiling? We're trying to make that ceiling bigger and get people that have some kind of online audience to actually create playlists. Hmm. So that's kind of like something we're working on. So yeah, Spotify is trying to own everything, but we're trying to make our piece of the pie bigger, right? Um, right. 
because for an artist, it's super tough to get on those bigger playlists straight out of it the is. gate. It is. So what is encouraging influencers to create their own playlists look like? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, a lot of it is just us reaching out to them and saying, mm -hmm. hey, we, we see that you have an online audience. Uh, you know, would you be interested? Because they're the kind of, there's a lot of people out there that could just create a playlist, share it on Twitter or Instagram and Facebook, and they would instantly get a couple thousand followers, right? Right. So that's kind of the angle that we're trying to take. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit more than just like, oh, we're going to pay you to do this. It's cool because like they actually have something that can help artists like move artists careers forward, which is cool. Mm. So that's kind of, we're still working it out, but uh, yeah, trying to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, in a perfect world, like Elon Musk creates a playlist and then he signs up to play this push and then, you know, everyone wants to get on that list. That's kind of like, <laughs> that's, that'd be like the top tier, right? So it's anywhere from him all the way down. Got you. Got you. Okay. So just from your experience, how do you guys even, how do you, qualify playlists for their their quality you know mm. what i mean yeah yeah it's a good question so what we do is like when a curator signs up to play this push they're on like a week trial period so uh -huh. we make sure they're listening to the songs uh we can see if they're copying pacing reviews and then the most important thing for us is we can actually measure their playlist and see how many monthly listeners it has if it mm. only if it has like less than one percent listener to follower ratio we'll remove them from the platform so, I mean, we've had playlisters that have, you know, over a hundred thousand followers and we've kicked them out because you get on that playlist and then you get, you know, 10, 20 new listeners from it. You're going to be pissed, right? It's like going back to managing expectations. So that makes sense. Yeah. That's like, I think that's been our biggest thing is managing the network, making sure we only have people in there that want to actually like help any artists and aren't just seeing it as like, oh, wow, I can make money from this website and really vetting those people out before they even start getting paid to review songs. Mm. So, yeah, that's interesting Go, going back to that managing expectations part. So what is the hardest part about that process? Do you guys have it down to a system where it's just easy to, to vet out those people or is it still a little difficult at times? Yeah, no, I mean, everything's systematized. Um, we actually added something new so that if you change the name of your playlist to something completely different, um then we actually automatically remove it until someone physically until one of us logs in and checks it mm -hmm. and if it's like a top hits 2019 to top hits 2020 like okay cool we can keep that person in but if they're just trying to create the name of like new albums like a, a mm -hmm. new rap album comes out and like every right. week changing the name that's not really helping us out right like yeah those mm -hmm. playlists are cool because it's going to get you a few streams right out of the gate but it's really tough to actually maintain that audience. So it doesn't make sense for us to have those playlists in the network. So yeah, I mean, pretty much everything is automated end to end um, for curators. And it's, it's tough for us because people are like pissed, you know, they're like, Hey, I signed up and you deleted my account. It's like, yeah, dude, you signed up. We scan your playlist. It sucks. You were automatically removed. So, you know, they're always like <laughs> getting on the chat and want to know, cause they don't know what we're doing on our end. Right. We're just saying right. like, Hey, your playlist isn't that good and you can't sign up. So sorry. Um, but I mean, it's, it's nice that we have that because if we didn't, it would, it would be a shit show. It would be extremely hard to figure out who we can work with and who we can. Gotcha. Okay. So what are obviously, okay. You have these things like the whole murky business article and I mean, so many people who speak negatively on playlists in general, mm -hmm. how, has there been difficult times, right? As play, as a company or like where your playlisters might fall off in quality or, or do you guys ever have trouble trying to give um, certain results or how, do, yeah, how does that work? Or did you, I, I guess the best way to say it in your own language, did you guys ever have trouble where expectations were mismanaged? Yeah, for sure. I think the, we had, we just, we've had a few rough patches where, you know, someone would use playlist push and then they would like blog about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And what, what happens is like people will see like, Oh, playlist push review and click on it and read it. But 
like I swear at least 90% of those people don't listen to the actual record we promoted, right? It's not linked in there. It's just saying like, hey, I didn't get on that many playlists and this is what happened. It's like, dude, go listen to the song and then <laughs> we can chat about it, right? Yeah. So that's been tough because um, we do run a lot of campaigns sometimes and it's tough to like keep track of like every single thing and and who's coming to the website and who's saying what. So you know and it goes both ways like if someone has an amazing experience and each song goes out does well they're not gonna like write about it right and say oh wow these guys are amazing they're just gonna keep using it Be like all right this is dope i'm not telling anyone about this yeah. so that's kind of that's been the tough part and i think you know we're working on building that out and starting to tell those stories of some of the artists we've worked with if they let us and that's kind of like where we're going now but I never want it to get to a point where like, oh yeah, we have all these case studies and look how great these artists did because really, man, it's based on the music. Like the people that get results and do well, they have good music, they get it, like they're in it for the long run. Um, yeah. And you know, there's other people that, you know, they're in it to promote whatever, you know, courses they're selling and they see an SEO land grab and, you know, they can write about our company and know that it's gonna pop up. So that's that's been super tough but also i think that sometimes it's been good because i feel like that's weeded out a lot of junk or people that don't 100 percent believe in what they're doing mm. um from not using the site so it's actually kind of like a blessing and a curse right i i don't Got want you. i don't want there to be all it's really weird if you only see amazing things about playlist push right it's like we're music promotion like do we hit everything out of the park no but what happens is we try to take care of the people that don't have good, that, you know, might not have a good campaign or only get added to a few playlists. Like we have systems in place to communicate with those people and help them out. Mm, interesting. Yeah, it's so funny because so many of the things resonate just because obviously I'm, you know, I'm in marketing. So I'm, I'm familiar with artists. Uh, for one, they can have a great experience, mm -hmm. which is the most frustrating thing in the world. And they not tell everybody. Right, like yeah. artists can be pretty selfish. They'll be like, no, I literally will not. Tell. I remember even on my YouTube channel early on, like people would be like, I would see somebody comment like, yeah, I'm not gonna tell anybody about this channel because I don't want, right. like, no, I need you to, <laughs> like, I, I might not even do this anymore if, if you don't yeah. tell people, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, of, because of what that does for growth. So it's definitely an interesting um, dance with that. And then of course, also just the idea of it not, not being able to completely oversell or not wanting to, right? If you're trying to manage expectations, mm -hmm. oversell maybe some of the bigger clients that you work with or certain results that you had because this being music, right? It's so not repeatable yeah. because of all these varieties and things like that. How do you guys sift through the artists? Okay, some of it naturally happens because they don't want to pay, right? Some of it naturally happens because they're, maybe feared off by misinformation or quality information, whatever. Um, but then what about those people who actually do apply and they, they're in your system? Mm -hmm. Is there a approval and, and denial um, system? What does that go like? Yeah. I mean, that depends directly on how busy we are. There's been times when we've had, you know, over 150 people applying each day. So, for any of, for me or my staff to go through there and listen to all of those songs to not even know if they were going to pay for a campaign sometimes is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. So it really just depends on the level of applicants like, and like how much business we're doing. So right. yeah, there's times when each song is listened to, but there's times when it's like, Hey, open the floodgates, whoever comes through, comes through. It's actually easier for us because and this is kind of like the managing expectations thing. We, we don't want people to have a negative because um, imagine artists apply and we say, oh, no, sorry, we can't work with you. They're going to be like, man, F those guys. Those guys are, they're going to get butt hurt, right? So they're going to start talking shit about playlist push. So it's actually easy. It's become easier for us to just let in as many people as we can, as long as the production's there and then clean it up on the back end. So if we they run a campaign, they get zero results we can give them a 50% refund, right? Mm. So it's easier to have systems in place on the back end than listen to all this 
not all junk, but I mean, man, some of the music that gets sent to us is like, it's kind of scary. It's like recorded into a tin can and there's like <laughs> it's basically a dude talking. So it, it's, so it's gotten kind of wild. Um, but I think that has become easier for us is to open the floodgates on the front end, but take care of people when the campaign wraps and make sure that, you know, they're not just like left hung out to dry. Got you. Interesting. Interesting. So the playlisters don't get pretty picky with things. Uh, I mean, it depends. Like we have the targeting pretty dialed and also for the curators, they get paid either way. They get paid a dollar to $15 per song, whether they uh, add it or not. So that's how the entire system works. Um, oh, so they so, like get paid basically to review, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. I mean, some curators, they want a ton of songs. Some curators are like, hey, only send me like five a week. So right. it kind of just depends. But most of them, like, they want to hear more music or, you know, they're, they're happy to listen to more songs. Got it. Interesting. Okay. Dope. So is there anything that you uh, just feel like it will be helpful to know um, for artists, whether it's about playlist push or just even about how you view these playlists in, in, in the marketplace um, as a whole? Is there anything you want to kind of leave people with? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, that's tough. I think the biggest thing honestly is um because the there's the toughest thing right now is distribution right so it's like hey do i use this company do i use TuneCore? Or like what's the best one and there's a lot of artists that would say oh yeah i don't want to give away a percentage of my music i want to just own everything well yeah you can do that but everything's on you you have to do everything it's actually easier if you can find a good distributor who's actually taking a percentage who's a little bit more invested in what you're doing that has those direct relationships with Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, whatever, to actually plug your music in if it's good. It's kind of low hanging fruit if you're an artist. It's like, what's the point of keeping everything if you're making zero, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of something that people don't even really think about. They're just like, oh, I gotta get my music out there. I'm just gonna use uh, X distributor to do that. So I think it's, keep in mind, like those people have they're delivering the music to those services, right? Someone there knows someone at Spotify or right. Apple Music. So that's one. Um, and then I think, you know, when you're ready to get in the playlist game, like make sure you're dialed. Like make sure you've got your bio filled out. Make sure you have, you know, Spotify artists dialed. You're submitting your songs two weeks before it comes out. Um, those are all kind of basic things that not everyone does. Got it. So taking care of your your whole profile and those basic you know crossing i's and no <laughs> crossing t's and dotting i's and then the other thing is really considering indie distributors more mm -hmm. yep got, got you got you i don't hear people talk much about those as well um so yeah. that's definitely an interesting take and i appreciate it so yeah for sure I, i'll if you're gonna put this on youtube right at some point, I will. It'll start in the, in the network. There'll be highlights on, on, on YouTube for sure. Cool. I mean, I can drop a comment with like a couple articles as well when you do that to that. on that subject for sure. Perfect. Well, cool. hey, other than that, uh, do, do you want people to follow you? Or do you want people um, to follow Playlist Push? I know you don't necessarily move when I need a lot of follows and things like that. Yeah, not really. I mean, just go to playlistpush.com. Um, there we yeah, go. I mean, you can follow me on Twitter. It's demo drop George. Um, I'm pretty active on there. That's probably the best, uh, probably least active on Facebook. So um, gotcha. don't, bother, don't bother sending me a friend request. <laughs> Facebook. All right, cool. Hey, as always, everybody, this video is brought to you by brandmannetwork.com. If you like it, go ahead to like button. If you like it, might as well share it. Then if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.